Today's message is, is God's principle of giving first, last. It sustains. So if I could pray for this message and then we'll get in. So Lord, Father, God, thank you for this. Thank you for this season, a season of revelation and, and correction and encouragement. Hmm. Thank you for the good, good eternal word. Thank you for this, this opportunity, this, this conviction for, for the entire body. That you were calling us into a season of, of correction and encouragement. Thank you, Father, for, for loving this church to want to use us as an example as a bright, bright light in these ever-darkening times. Thank you for making this an equipping church in Ephesians 4, 11, 12 church. Thank you for the gifts of the fivefold. And thank you for this word today. I pray for hearts that are willing to hear. I pray that I only speak the words that you give me in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's jump right in. So the one thing that the Lord put on my heart for this week is that the tithe clears the heart's path to relationship to God. You see, it's important because the chaos of the world was created in direct opposition to the peace of God. You see, Satan cannot create anything. All he can do is counterfeit and oppose. You see, you were meant to live in peace. You were meant to live in unity, not uniformity. And unity. And all the, the, the demonic noise of this world is meant to oppose that. See, your willingness to quiet the noise brings you into a place of peace, brings you into a place of relationship with God. Tithing, as I want to share with you today, it exposes those areas of opposition that, that block us from close relationship with our Father. The tithe is meant for relationship. So if we can stand together for our anchor scripture, and let's read this as the body. This is what quiets the noise of a demonic world. And we're going to read from James 1.18. We'll read together. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Thank you, Lord. Now, I know y'all are used to standing up for minutes and reading a lot of scripture, but, but that's what the Lord put on my heart. So uh, that's what we're going to do. So I do. I want to I say super transparent. I understand that last week's message on tithing was, was probably new for some people, or maybe the way that, that it was presented was, was different from what you've been taught in the past. But I want to share with you that, that many years ago, even as mature believers, Lee and I were in the same point as far as our understanding went, or I should say misunderstanding of the tithe. You see, we'd heard messages and very compelling messages uh, uh, based on just one twisted scripture, maybe two, and it compelled us to give. And although we always gave generously, to be honest with you, the term tithe became a dirty word. And it really caused us a lot of distress in our faith walk. You see, although we gave, we're like, but we're not tithing. We're not tithing. And you see, because of that, we were not in alignment with God's word or his will. But under sound biblical teaching, we came into an accurate understanding of the tithe and a deeper understanding and a relationship with God. Like we'd been delivered from a rebellion against the principle, strictly a principle that God had established to ensure that our hearts were always connected to His. We were railing against the principle of God only because we had listened to the chaos of a demonic world. I want to focus on God's intent for establishing the tithe as a means of keeping your heart close to God's. So, if last week challenged you, great going. Congratulations. That means that you're serious about God's Word. And you're open to growing into a deeper relationship with Him. We know this because 2 Timothy tells us this. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want to affirm that during this season of fasting that the Lord has put on my heart, that he wants us to come into righteous correction so he can multiply the blessings that he's going to use individually in your lives and as this church goes, as a bright light in a dry, dry area, desperate for the Holy Spirit. You see, if it's healthy, it grows. And if it grows, it changes. God wants you healthy. And that requires growth. Like part of growth is admitting that it can be hard. It can be hard to tithe. It can be hard to break off that, that 10% that we've grown to love. The monetary value. The idea of that's mine. I earned it. But you see, as you grow to know and love God, you trust that the good, good Father would never, ever harm you. Matthew 11 tells us, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I will tell you that that goes for every word of the Lord. Every word. He is our good, good Father. You know, I love that the men in this church reflect the good, good Father. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for, for good women. I'm thankful for good people. But it is so important to see the men of this church reflecting the Father. So I want to I take a little second. I want to cut some soul ties. You see, it's important to ensure that our souls are well cared for. It can be stressful to talk about money. And that's the way Satan wants it. That's the way Satan wants it. He wants us to not be able to talk about money or the hard things in our lives. Let's keep it secret. I want to make sure that your souls are cared for before we go any further. You see, Satan's done a masterful job at attaching a powerful emotion such as love or greed or fear to an inanimate object. But yet your feelings are valid and they deserve to be treated with the compassion of Christ. So I want to I make this, this charge. If you've had any previous experiences of being hurt by a church's oppressive financial obligations, if you've been threatened that you might lose your salvation if you don't pay up, if you've been pressured to give to a church or leave that church, or made to feel like you're anything less than a cherished, beloved child of God, I want to ask you that, you that you forgive those who have hurt you. I want to ask you that you forgive those who hurt you. Now, forgiving someone doesn't say what they did was right. Forgiveness is a gift for you. Forgiveness separates you from the one who hurt you. If you don't, you become like a puppet, like a marionette attached to their strings. Any string or button that they push your soul will always be tethered to their demonic oppressions. Forgive those who have hurt you relative to givings or making you feel under oppression for financial obligations. God's given you a gift. God's given you a gift, and God wants you to reclaim that gift. You see, I want to, I want to also make sure that we keep the important thing the important thing. Part of my assignment today from the Holy Spirit is to ensure that you understand the deep truths about the tithe. You see, that also requires addressing some common misconceptions. You know, like Satan, like Satan will whisper things in other people's ears 
to turn them against you. They won't come and talk to you. They will take the, the whisper, the gossip, the rumor of the devil and use it as gospel truth against a person of righteousness. He creates a false narrative against the tithe to separate you from God. The issue that I want to I make sure that you're clear is an issue of salvation. What I want to encourage you is if the evidence that we're presenting has not led you into a heart for tithing yet, that's okay. That's okay. Tithing is not a salvation issue. I want you to be clear. Tithing is not a salvation issue. Will you go to hell if you don't tithe? Will you go to hell if you don't serve? No. No. The tithe is simply a gift to you to help you clear any obstacles between yourself and the heart of God. We know this, Ephesians 1, 13, 14. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The second, the instant, the twinkling, whatever's faster than that, you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You were sealed by the promise, the down payment of the Holy Spirit. Is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purpose possession to the praise of His glory. Your eternal destination is already sealed. Unlike some religions or, or, or whatever they call themselves, your salvation is not for sale. You cannot buy your way into heaven. So I want your soul to rest well as we continue to march in the truth of Scripture. So what does relationship with God look like? Well, I think, I think in the natural, we think of relationships as casual or acquaintances or friends. And, but you see, what's important to understand is God moves in an eternal realm. Like we say things like, oh, that's my BFF. That's my BFF over there. That's my best friend forever. But you know, the truth is, the truth is, we have no concept of forever. God is the eternal God of forever. Covenant relationships, they reflect the one true BFF. See, that can only be between you and God. That covenant relationship is the only, only eternal relationship. So I don't want us to diminish the word covenant or friend or forever. See, the one way God establishes his relationship with us, his covenant, his partnership, is with you through wealth provisions. God's principle of first giving is an example of, it's an example to lost people that his covenant of redemption remains active. If you don't know that God is still alive, I want you to take joy in knowing God is still alive. He is the same God in creation. He will be the same God through revelation. You see, Deuteronomy 8.18 tells us, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he has swore to your fathers as it is this day. So I don't want you to, I don't want you to go off into the, the demonic chaos. Well, there's that prosperity gospel. There's that prosperity gospel. I want you to know God wants you to prosper. He wants you to multiply. He wants you to be fruitful. And one of the ways that he establishes this covenant is through the tangible generation of provision. Now, he's not an ATM throwing down money. Don't go to your mailbox looking for the check. This isn't a pension. He gives you power. He gives you wisdom. So you can put in the work to generate your wealth. You see, it's so important for us to renew our relational minds. It's important for us to renew the way we look at relationships. 
You see, we usually think of, of wealth and provision as something that we got to earn. It gives us a sense of pride and influence and identity. That's my money. That's my salary. No, that's my position. You know, I've told you guys, when I was a chief of police and as I rose through the ranks, I would only associate with those people equal or above the rank. If you were a deputy or, or, or something else, I didn't have time for you. And I would challenge before you're like, oh yeah, I knew there was something wrong with you. I would challenge that a lot of us are that way. We kind of we we put these uh, informal, unfair social strata in our lives. There's only certain kind of people we'll talk to. And that ain't the way it's supposed to be. You see, there's a problem with that. When we look at wealth and provision as something we earned, as something we deserve, as something we work for, what I'm asking you is to change your thinking. We've got to renew our minds to think the way that God thinks about provisions. I challenge in uh, Romans 12 too, and I'm going to read the NLT on this one. And it says, renew in your mind. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And perfect. God's will for you is perfect. You see, we've been conformed to the patterns of this world regarding wealth and favor and blessings. I'll give an example, and I think we're all, I think we're all at that, that same age where, where we remember the Joneses. Y'all remember the Joneses? I think we always, we grew up resenting the Joneses because we had to keep up with them. As a child, I didn't know who the Joneses were, but I didn't like them. I didn't like them because they caused stress for my family. and we, we were poor as it was. We didn't need to keep up with somebody I didn't know. But you see what God says? God says, I bless the Joneses. I bless the Joneses as an example of how I love the Joneses and how I provide for the Joneses, how I've created a covenant relationship with the Joneses. And it's not to make us hate the Joneses. It's to make us see a tangible example of God's provision for God's people. Be it the Joneses or the Smiths or the James or the Rodriguez's. God's covenant is for God's people. We've got to change the way we think about covenant relationship with God. God shows His covenant provisions. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 tells us, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. I want you to take a break. I want you to think all things. What all things do you need right now? It may not be financial. It may be peace. It may be companionship. It may be wisdom. It may be a deeper understanding into God's will for your life. It might just be the, the simplicity of friendship. What are the all things that you need in your life right now? What I will tell you, God's covenant provides that. God's covenant provides that. But I will tell you that you've got to be in alignment with God's will for your life. You cannot live willy-nilly helter-skelter and expect to catch a little, a little blessing raindrops. You've got to stand in the rain to receive the downpour of blessings. So you should be asking, well, how do I unlock God's blessings of these covenant provisions? I will tell you, reverent fear of the Lord. Obedience. Obedience to the Lord. Tithing is bringing to God the first 10% of your finances. It is an act of obedience to honor God. Now, I know I grew up, I think a lot of us maybe in the 60s and 70s, and we're like, we like kind of being rebellious. We like being a little rebellious. Let me tell you, rebellious doesn't work. 
rebellious stubborn. I always appreciate a, a maverick in a movie. But this ain't a movie. This is your eternal life that we're talking about. God has a plan for you. Within that plan is the kingdom. This is a kingdom of governance and structure and rules and laws. And just like your house, when you've, when you've secured your house, locked the doors, covered the electrical outlets, then you let the kids and the grandkids run wild and have fun. God wants you to have fun within the structure that he's created for your protection, not for your oppression. I want you to understand that. The tithe is simply an act of obedience to the Lord. We know that this obedience, we know that Leviticus 27.30 tells us, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Now that's the word of the Lord. The tithe is holy to the Lord. You see, being obedient to the tithe, it's not going to make God love you more or keep Him from loving you at all. But it does allow you the opportunity to draw closer to Him through knowing His will. Knowing and living within God's will, it's where His abundant favor is found. You can be rebellious. You can be all the rebellion you want. But you are not walking in his favor you're under grace if you've received jesus as your lord and savior but then there's favor obedience to god living within his will is where abundant favor is found he loves us so much he even gave us a simple blueprint for knowing his will and the way to come closer to him y'all remember when you first started courting your spouse what you want to do? I don't know what you want to do. I don't Like, that was cute. But after 10, 20, 40 years of marriage, it's like, just tell me what you want. I'll do it. Like, commun open communication is the key. And when we tithe, we remove any barriers that reflect away the character of God. That is all the tithe is done. The favor of God is the character of God reflected in our lives. And that benefits all the areas of our lives. From our health, to our finances, to our careers, to joy, to peace, to our spiritual gifts. Coming into right alignment. And we don't have to guess. We don't have to guess what is God's will. How do we, how do we fall into alignment with that will? You see, a lot of churches will say, just behave. Just be good. But you know what that does? That puts us back in our childhood, in these performance-based relationships, where you just be a good boy. Well, how do you quantify good, right? God's not a performance-based God. God loves you unconditionally. God's given you a, a simple blueprint to come into relationship with Him. He doesn't, waste, he doesn't want you wasting your short time on this earth wondering and guessing and trying to figure out what's His will. He doesn't want you on your deathbed going, I wish he would have told me what to do. From the moment you received his son, he has been telling you what to do. Not in an impressive way, oppressive, but to elevate you, to bring you into joy and peace. The favor of God is reflected in the character of God. Like Jesus himself gives the instructions to unlock God's plan. All the scriptures we go through that says heaven is like, the kingdom is like. Like Jesus ain't telling carnival jokes. He's telling you this is how to do it. Let's go to Matthew 6, uh, 9 and 10. It's uh, known as the Lord's Prayer. They asked him. They see Jesus praying all the time. And they're like, teach us how to pray. We don't want to spin our wheels. We don't want to spin our wheels anymore. We want to go straight to the heart of the Father. We want the promised abundant blessings of the Lord. So we're going to walk this out and break it down just a bit. Matthew 6, 9. In this manner, therefore pray. Anybody got a question about the intention of this? In this manner, therefore pray. Begging, walking around, nice clothes. Church attendance, 
That ain't it. In this man. Y'all do this. Start with prayer. Our Father in heaven. So who are we praying to? Our Father. Not the Dallas Cowboys. Not some, not some friend with a little extra cash that you hope's going to chump some off so you can get through the week. Our Father in heaven. So just so everybody's clear, where is he? He's in heaven. He's in the exact same place that you want those blessings to come from. Heaven, not the world. Not the world. Hallowed be your name. In the Hebrew, it's Kadesh. It means holy, sacred, set apart, worthy of reverence, worthy of fear. If you're not in a, in a, in a Kadesh relationship with God the Father, you've got to get right. You've got to come to the Lord. You've got to hallow be your name. Your kingdom come. You're asking God's reign and rule to be established on earth as it is in heaven. It is a request for God to bring his perfect plan to unfold in your life. Do you believe? Do you believe? No raise of hands. Do you believe that heaven can be dragged down to earth? Yes. Amen. You see, your will be done. Whose will? God's will. Do what? Be done. God's will is that we live in alignment with him by, by reflecting his divine character. By reflecting his divine character. You see, I call it God's garden blueprint for life. God gave us a plan. We, we muddle through this life. We're like, if I just knew what you wanted for my life. He's like, go back to the garden. Go back to my garden blueprint. This is what I want for your life. This is my will for your life. This is his plan. Genesis 1.28. Then God bless them. Who? Them. Who's them? Adam and Eve. Adam. Adam. Adam in the, in, the, in the Hebrew. Mankind. Anthropos in the Greek. Humanity. God blessed humanity. God bless mankind. God bless you. God bless you. And God said to them, who's them? You. Let's make this personal. This is God talking to you. God's talking to you. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. You want to know God's will for your life? This is it. That was it. <laughs> this is it. Genesis 1.28. You don't have to go no further. You don't have to go no further. You go further than this, and you find yourself on the other side uh, of a uh, cherubim with flaming swords. This is God's will for your life. The whole process of redemption is bringing you back to the garden. You can stop toiling and wondering and beating yourself up and, and, and hypothesizing these theories that aren't even real. You want to know God's will for your life? Right here. It's right there. Now let's walk it out in Matthew. Now we're at 6.10. On heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. How can God's, how can God's will in heaven be done on earth? Well, let me tell you. It takes you and the Holy Spirit and your believer's authority. To do what? To pull heaven to earth. You have the authority, the believer's authority, to bring heaven to earth. Do you believe that? You see, I think the, the problem with, with a Christian, the, let's say Western Christianity, is that it's weak. It's weak. They're so worried about putting people in the chairs. And equipping church is to grow the folks that show up here. I 
want you to come into understanding in your believer's authority. Not because you as a good person wants heaven to come down, but you in partnership with God, the Holy Spirit, have the believer's authority to pull heaven down to earth. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that everything that Jesus says is true? Yes. Amen. <laughs> if not, we're going to talk after. We're going to talk after. Why would Jesus have taught this? The disciples, his closest padnas, down on the bayous of Louisiana, that's friends. Why would he teach his closest padnas how to pray? Why would he tell them that? And as an example to us, why would Jesus say that if you could not bring heaven to earth? If God's will in heaven could not be done on earth? Why would he tell you that? Because he loves you. Because he is, he is aching. He is going to the cross for you to go back to the garden promise. And you don't have to wait until your last day. You can start living, reclaiming the promise of the garden blueprint now. Because you've got you. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got the believer's authority. Man, it will transform your life when you come into understanding that this is God's will for your life. That heaven, as it is in heaven, be done on earth now. You don't have to wait till we see New Jerusalem coming down. Now. But how do you start? By coming into alignment with God. <clears throat> we've got to be in, we've got to be in right, righteous alignment with God. You see, God's given you everything first. He only, wants, he only wants your heart and your love for Him to last. I told last week, and I say it, I think we come in, a, it's like this church niceosity. We come in a church and we feel like we got to be, oh, I love you, brother, I love you, brother. And nobody wants to Matthew 18 anybody anymore, unless it's done over Facebook or something like that. But you see, that, that surface sugar pop, that's not love. That's not agape love. Digging in, pressing in, going to battle, going to warfare. That's the love of God. That's a copy of love. This is what God wants for us. This is what God wants for us. He wants our love for Him to last. He doesn't want it based on emotions. Y'all probably tired of hearing me say it, but Jesus is not your boyfriend. He's not your boyfriend. He's a holy, reverent God. Only until you come into an understanding that He's a holy, reverent God will your love for Him last. If you want God's abundant favor, do this. Start with this. Matthew 6.33 tells us, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So I asked you earlier, when, when, we, when 2 Corinthians tells us all these things, that you will have an abundance. Whatever you need, God wants to give to you. And he said, well, that's good. How do I get there? Start this. First, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We had a message about a month ago where Abram was told he pitched his tent and he built his altar. And it was a wonderful message. And I wonder how many people are focused on building their tent and they've neglected their altar. Build your altar. Build their altar so the consuming fire of God, the refining fire of God has a place to, to land in your life. Don't worry about building your tent. Tents are temporary. Build your altar. Seek first the kingdom of God. You see the principle of first? This is the key to activating the will of God. You're like, I want some heaven. I want some heaven down to earth. Good. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then understand that the principle of first is the key to activating the will of God. Why? 1 John 4.19 tells us we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. The only reason we exist is because God first gave to us. You see, giving is a part of God's character. When we offer back to God what he first gave to us, we reflect that same character. That is being in the will of God. That is being in the will of God. The revelation during the season of fasting I want to affirm, I want to reaffirm that God's will is that we renew our pursuit of relationship with Him as a holy, reverend God through obedience with the tithe. 
That is a challenge to the church. Are you willing to bring back to me what I first gave to you so I can bless you abundantly? That is the revelation for this season. It's not about giving cash. It's about honoring commands. And I want to tell you, we're right on target. The conversations that I've had with so many people since last Sunday have, are bringing affirmation and confirmation not because of what I said, but because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in your lives. Like, I want you to hit the blessings bullseye. I want God's will to be done in your life. So where do you start? It's simple. Offer your first. God first gave His Son, Jesus Christ, as the first fruit to redeem us from our corrupted sin nature. God set the pattern of first giving, of first fruit. 1 Corinthians tells us that. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. God first gave His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the first fruit. He is asking the body to replicate, to reflect the act of first giving, the principle of first that we offer to God. And this redeems the rest of what we maintain authority over. You see, Exodus 13, 2 tells us, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb amongst the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. Now you say, well, that's Israel. Well, we shared last week. We are all spiritual descendants of Father Abraham. I want you to see and hear again the word consecrate, kadash in the Hebrew. Set it apart. It is holy. The first. The first redeems the rest. Jesus redeemed you. He redeemed us. You see, once we offer our first fruits to God, He redeems the rest so He can bless us through the tithe. Proverbs 3, 9, 10 tells us, Honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with wine. Now, this isn't just about being a being fat cat and having a big bank account. This is God establishing His covenant with you. Establishing His covenant. Remember Deuteronomy 8.18. This is why He gives provision to establish His covenant. Not so you can drive around in a fancy car to establish His covenant with you. So you know that He is a real, tangible God. And the tithe also provides protection. Romans eleven sixteen. For the first fruit is holy. Why is the first fruit holy? Because it's consecrated. Because who is the first fruit? Jesus. He's consecrated. For the first fruit is holy. The lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are also the branches. We've taught about teaching on the leaven. A little bit of leaven spoils the whole loaf. But if, if it's holy, the whole lump is holy. You see, Paul tells us in Romans that our first fruit offering to God consecrates the rest so that it can be protected and multiplied to bless and provide for you. A question, you ever wonder where all your money goes? I mean, you ever wonder where it goes? Like I tell you, your money don't love you. Your money doesn't have any emotion. Your money will get up and walk out of your wallet and it won't even tell you goodbye. It won't even ghost text you. You know when you text somebody and then you see like those three dots? And you're waiting for the reply? That's a ghost text. Your money won't even ghost text you. It just get up and goes. You know why? Because there's no protection over it. Because it's not been consecrated by the first fruit. You see, all God's asking you to honor Him back with, because He's given you everything, is 10%. 10%. And you can't negotiate 10%. The word tithe literally means tenth. So you can't negotiate it down. What I've shared is if you want to give more than 10%, that's your tithe. Anything above that is your, is your offering and giving. So if you ever wonder, like, where's all my money go? Well, what I'll tell you, if it's not protected by the redemption of the principle of first, it's vulnerable to the devourer. Who's the devourer? Satan, mammon, the spirit of materialism. Maybe, maybe some uh, materialism itself. So how about some self-pride? You see, the world is competing, not for your 10%, for everything. You know why it wants everything? It wants you back in the bondage of slavery. It wants you to put you back in the, in the bondage of poverty and debt and fear. 
You see Malachi, uh, it's 3.11, it tells us, And I, this is the Lord, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the first of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit. That is for you in the field, says the Lord your host. When you give that first, when you offer that first, that first fruit, the principle of first, you're reflecting what God did for us by giving us His Son, the first fruit. And then the rest is protected from the devourer. The rest is protected from the devourer. You know, I really do. I want you to to understand the principle. God wants you to be a good steward. And, and I will tell you that when you start to offer back to God, you become so mindful of what you're doing with the provisions God gives you. It's a challenge because I'm going to tell you, on the other side of obedience, John 10.10 10 tells us, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come, this is the Lord, I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. So there's no neutral ground. There's no neutral ground. You've got the world. You've got the devourer. You've got materialism and the evil spirit of mammon that is looking, working, striving to take the provisions that you have. The tithe will set you free from the idolization of materialism by ensuring that your heart is only for God. Only for God. So how do I honor the principle of first? Well, I think we put a slide up there. This is tangible. A lot of times we go to church, we're like, oh, I get it, I get it. We walk out like, I'm really not sure. Let's just be real for just a second. When you get paid, set it aside, consecrate it. Now, this is not my idea. This is not Dave Ramsey's idea. This is biblical. This is biblical. You want to turn things around? You want to turn things around? The moment you get paid, you set aside, you consecrate that first 10%. And I don't mean just just like, oh, in this part of your wallet, in this part. I mean, if you get cash or a check, you take out that 10% immediately and you stick it in an envelope. You consecrate it. You protect that 10%. At this point, it's not just, it's not money. It's an offering to God. You consecrate it. If you receive direct deposit for pay, you calculate your 10% and then you send it. You send it however you do it, online or Zelle or whatever, however you bring your offering. Don't let it mingle. Don't let it mingle with the rest of the, with the money, with the world's money. That 10% is for God. Don't allow your tithe, your consecrated offering to the Lord to co-mingle with other money. And look, you got to treat it different than what you use for your utilities and your Netflix. If, I mean, you can just dole out 10% if you want to. But I'm giving you the formula to turn things around. I'm giving you the formula to walk into blessing. You take that offering and you consecrate it. And then don't just throw it in the, in the basket. I want you to do what Jesus did with the offering. I want you to look at this. I want you to pray over it. I want you to pray blessings as a result of it because it's no longer a monetary amount. It becomes a consecrated offering to the Lord. I want you to treat it like that. What did Jesus do with an offering? 641, uh, Mark 641. Jesus took the five loaves and two fishes, looked up towards heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. Jesus took something of value, food, substance, and he lifted it to God as the offering that it is. And he prayed and he blessed over it. And then it kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. This is what God will do for the provisions that he gives you to establish his covenant with you. You see, healthy stewards are blessed stewards. Tithing establishes the supernatural priority that God's first in your life. I want to share a quick scripture. And Ellie, if you want to come up, a a quick testimony. You 
you know, I shared at the beginning that, that Lee and I were always very generous givers. And, and we had heard some bad teaching, some bad manipulative teaching on the tithe. And it's called proof texting. When they'll take a scripture here and a scripture there and, they, and they'll twist them. And you're like, all right. But then you put a lot of good uh, logic behind it. It caused us a lot, of, uh, a lot of grief. And we understood that we were out of God's will when we came into right teaching. That was based on scripture. And I want to I share this with you. This was a part of our, our testimony. But you know, years ago, Lee and I, we both walked away from the heights of our careers. And I will tell you that we were both at the top of our careers. In that, God asked us, do I really come first? I mean, listen, it's easy to be faithful when you got a fat bank account, right? It's easy to, to tithe. It's easy to give when there's cash in the bank. And the Lord asks us both, am I really first in your life? And I'm going to tell you what, we were convicted. We were convicted because our bank accounts were full. They were full. And we, we came into surrender to the conviction of the Lord. I will tell you, because I want you to understand where we were and the conviction of God's word, we gave up everything. We had health care paid for the rest of our lives. We had free vehicles. I had a full pension waiting for me. If I'd only said no to God's call in my life, if I'd sat in an office for four more years, I'd have had 30-year full pension the rest of my life. I walked away from that. We had national and international influence. In the highest realms of government and, and, and her skill. I will tell you that we earned millions of dollars a year in profit. I'm not exaggerating. Millions of dollars a year. And we gave at least 30% of everything. But we were so against the tithe because it had been taught to us in a way to manipulate us. And yet we were not in God's will. God freed us by a simple, simple question. Am I really first in your life? We realize we mistook financial prosperity and extravagant giving for obedience. We walked away from everything. I'm telling you, everything. And whether we had millions or we had hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating for effect, whether we had millions or we had hundreds, we continued to tithe. And I will tell you, from years ago to this morning, standing over that swimming pool and that persevering frog, the Lord has never stopped multiplying fishes and loaves in our lives. God wants to use the body of Five Stones Church as a covenant example, not just to non-believers, but to the lukewarm Christians that He has promised us to vomit out. God wants to use your lives. God wants to use this church as an example in these coming perilous times, that His promise of abundant favor remains as powerful today as it was when it was first established. I pray that you take these words. I pray that you take these words and let them, and let them speak to you. So if we can stand as the body, I know I've gone a little over, and I, and I pray that you forgive me for that. I always tell you, when the cloud moves, we move. And when it stops, it stops. And y'all are like, well, that's good. Until we get to about four minutes over on the message. So I just want you to know, I want you to know, church, that we are in the cloud. We are in the cloud. The Holy Spirit is in you, and it's with you, and it is upon us. So I'm going to ask you right now, if you've not brought your tithes forward or online or whatever the, the ways that, that the Lord's made to, to bring them forward, I would ask now in response to this word from the Lord, I would ask for a response. And if you've not brought your, your offering before the Lord, I, I, I open the time now that you do. 
And I want to pray. I want to pray over this church. I'm so thankful. You know, I've started my fifth week of fasting. The Lord has revealed such a heart, such a heart for everyone in this church. For the folks that have been from the beginning and the new folks that are coming and and the folks that are still deciding, the Lord is moving in your life. This time of offering, this time of teaching, this time of correction, I will tell you that He is moving you into a new season. It is going to require your tensile strength to be hardened, to carry the weight of what He's bringing. And I don't mean weight of burden. I mean the yoke of easy and light, of abundant blessings. So Lord, we thank You, Father. We thank You. We praise You. We praise You for the, for the spiritual gift of long-suffering, for not becoming impatient as we share Your Word. Lord, I pray that this message, that this Word resonates with the heart. I pray that it brings the body into conviction and correction so that you can begin to pour out your abundant blessings. I am so excited to hear the testimonies of your provision once we come into obedience. Lord, I'm thankful for the gift of the tithe, the gift of the tithe through the principle of first giving. I'm thankful that it is a gift that simply clears the path so our hearts stay connected to yours. It is a tool of discerning to brush away the chaos of this world. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.